Coulson, get back to base. This is a level seven. As of right now, we are at war. What do we do? One of the things you gotta love about Joss Whedon is that he rarely lets a detail go to waste. My favorite example is what you just saw from the first Avengers movie, when he uses the film title card literally as an answer to a question that's been posed by a character on screen. It's a great little joke because it sets the tone for the whole movie. By drawing attention to the film's packaging, Whedon is letting us know that he knows that this is just a movie, that it's not gonna take itself too seriously, and that there are going to be jokes. That man is playing Galaga. He does a similar thing at the end of Avengers 2, using a creative cut that literally plants a word in your head. Avengers! Hopefully, we're all thinking of the same word. Now, maybe it's a small thing, but the way art is packaged has always fascinated me. Because packaging like this is just another thing that the artist has to choose. It ought to be a creative decision like all the creative decisions that went into the work itself. Of course, when you're dealing with big properties and millions of dollars, artists don't always or even usually get to choose what a film or a book title is going to be. The book cover or the movie poster is often designed with commercial incentives in mind, but that's not the case for all art forms or even all forms of packaging. Whedon obviously had to name his film The Avengers, but he found an interesting way to work that title into the film. Similarly, in the 2006 James Bond movie Casino Royale, director Martin Campbell and the team were looking to reboot the franchise for a post-Austin Powers, post-Campy era to make it more gritty and in line with the best action films of the time. Obviously, they had to include the iconic gun barrel sequence, but by foregoing the normal dot 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 gun barrel, instead working it into the story, they broadcast the message that this Bond is a different beast altogether. My interest in this kind of packaging, I think, springs from epigraphs, those quotes you see at the beginning of books. I use epigraphs to signal that the reader should look in a certain direction while reading, that they should keep certain things in mind, perhaps. That's a favorite writer of mine, M. John Harrison, who I think hits the point exactly. Epigraphs, indeed all the trappings that exist in and around a work of art, are in some way a part of it. They're instructions, or simply suggestions on how to receive the project in question. This is a good example from Tarantino's grindhouse feature, Death Proof, which couches the story in the look and feel of the exploitation genre movies of the 1970s, all the way down to the grainy film stock and the fake trailers for similarly styled B-movies after it. <laughs> And these kinds of touches, though not directly part of the film itself, paint the immediate space around the movie with a kind of aura that sets the mood. Of course, there are plenty of examples of beautiful title sequences going back through the history of film. The king of them all is Saul Bass, the designer behind everything from Psycho and Vertigo to Goodfellas and Casino. Now here's how Bass views his job. I had felt for some time that the audience involvement with a film should really begin with the very first frame. There seemed to be a real opportunity to use titles in a new way, to actually create a climate for the story that was about to unfold. Bass's philosophy of establishing the film's climate lives on, even if extended title sequences are becoming a little less common. Actually, I've been noticing a lot of these title sequences moving to the end of films. The closing credits of Blue Valentine, for example, features quick firework glimpses of the relationship that just ended with the film. I remember watching these credits in the theater and being completely transfixed as they send your mind back across the story, making the heartbreak of the ending even more poignant. And on the complete other side of the spectrum, the closing credit sequence of 22 Jump Street is a brilliant send-up of Hollywood's franchise mentality of endless sequels. And it's maybe the first time I've ever seen a credit sequence that is even funnier than an already hilarious movie. One of the examples I love most is the title sequence from Francois Truffaut's adaptation of Fahrenheit 451, a story about a society that doesn't allow its citizens to read books. So to banish words from the viewer's mind, Truffaut has the opening titles read aloud instead. From a novel by Ray Bradbury, 
Music by Bernard Herrmann. Director of photography, Nicholas Rogue. Not every film or every piece of art needs to pay so much attention to the packaging that surrounds it. But I love something like this because it actually adds to the story. The same could be said for the title sequence of The Wire, which entwines fragments of all the narrative perspectives of the show, and even some footage from the episodes themselves, and puts them on an equal footing, reinforcing creator David Simon's maxim that The Wire is not about Jim McNulty or Avon Barksdale or crime or punishment or drugs or violence. It's about the city. These titles, I think, do a little more than echo the theme. They help to develop it. All artists are trying in some way to get their intentions across to an audience, even if that intention is to make the packaging around their work as minimal as possible. A number of painters don't title their canvases, for example, or simply name them with a number. The idea here is to take the work on its own terms. Movies and books don't have that option, but when Woody Allen uses the same font and title sequence for every single movie he's ever done, the point, I think, is to look beyond the titles to the film itself. But even that non-decision is a kind of decision. I mean, the title isn't the most important thing about a movie, but attention to detail is something that I appreciate as a filmgoer. I mean, if you're going to spend all that time and all that money making a feature film, why not try to make everything in and around it meaningful? Forget it. I, I can't go in. Two minutes, Sally. No, I'm sorry. I can't do it. We, we've blown it already. I, you know, uh, I, I can't go in in the middle. In the middle? We only miss the titles. They're in Swedish. There is a new Nerdwriter video every Wednesday, so if you click that box right there, you'll subscribe to this channel and get all the videos. Ah! <sighs> My girlfriend just, just scared the shit out of me. I have to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. They make sleek, intuitive websites. I just made one called thenerdwriter.net. You can check that out. Um, and if you sign up for a year, you can get a free domain name. And if you use the offer code nerdwriter, you can get 10% off your first purchase. Um, also, me and my girlfriend are going to be living in Venice, Italy for the next month, starting Friday. So if you live out there, if you, uh, if you wanna get in touch, you can email me at thenerdwriter.gmail uh, and I will see you guys uh, next Wednesday. The rest of you, hopefully I see some of you in Venice.